This is Dr. Benjamin Ansel from the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Welcome to this CME activity. Current evidence-based recommendations support the calculation of coronary heart disease risk for patients who are at intermediate risk by using a number of important patient parameters. However, these calculated risk values may underestimate CHD risk, thereby inappropriately prompting the use of less intensive therapies to mitigate that risk. In addition, recently defined goals to reduce CHD risk are not being appropriately targeted with the use of intensive medical regimens in clinical practice. I'll address these issues in two challenging patient cases, which are designed to promote the accurate assessment of CHD risk and the prevention of CHD with guideline and evidence-based interventions. Case one focuses on the calculation of the CHD risk in a 46-year-old man with poorly controlled hypertension and dyslipidemia and the reduction of this risk by using therapeutic lifestyle changes and evidence-based pharmacotherapy. Case two focuses on the assessment of CHD risk in a 58-year-old woman with type 2 diabetes and dyslipidemia and presents therapeutic approaches for attaining defined lipid goals. Choose a case by clicking on the appropriate tab below. BC is a 46-year-old obese man who presents as a new patient with the hope that he can stop taking his blood pressure medication. He has a history of hypertension, for which he has been taking hydrochlorothiazide 25 milligrams daily for three years. He smoked about a half a pack of cigarettes daily for the last 28 years, but quit six weeks ago in anticipation of undergoing this evaluation. He has no history of coronary or other vascular diseases and denies a history of high cholesterol levels or diabetes mellitus. He walks his dog almost daily, but does not engage in any other exercise. His 51-year-old brother recently underwent coronary stent placement, and his father developed type 2 diabetes two years before dying of complications from a stroke at the age of 78 years. His examination shows that at a height of 5 feet 11 inches and a weight of 233 pounds, he has a body mass index of 31.1 kilograms per square meter. His waist circumference is 39 inches. His blood pressure is 161 over 93 millimeters mercury, and his heart rate is 68 beats per minute. The remainder of his physical examination is normal. Laboratory evaluation reveals a fasting glucose level of 107 milligrams per deciliter. Lipid panel results are as follows. Total cholesterol 221, HDL cholesterol 36, LDL cholesterol 150, and triglycerides 178 milligrams per deciliter. His electrocardiogram and urinalysis are normal. He has no microalbuminuria. Which of the following is true regarding BC's coronary heart disease risk according to NCEP ATP3 guidelines? The best answer is two. He has metabolic syndrome. According to the ATP3 guidelines, the criteria for metabolic syndrome in men include any three of the five following measurements, a waist circumference of 102 centimeters, 40.2 inches or greater, a blood pressure measurement of 130 over 85 or higher, a fasting glucose level of greater than 100 milligrams per deciliter, an HDL cholesterol level less than 40 milligrams per deciliter, and a triglycerides level of 150 milligrams per deciliter or greater. In the case of BC, he meets exactly four of these criteria, demonstrating an elevated blood pressure measurement, elevated fasting glucose level, a low HDL cholesterol level, and an elevated triglycerides level. The designation smoker means any history of cigarette smoking within the last month. Therefore, BC is not considered a current smoker. He does not have a coronary risk equivalent because he does not have a history of type 2 diabetes, symptomatic carotid artery disease, an abdominal aortic aneurysm, or peripheral vascular disease. BC's coronary risk is increased and likely underestimated by the Framingham risk score because of the presence of multiple major CHD risk factors other than an elevated LDL cholesterol level. Specifically, he is older than 45 years of age, he has hypertension, his HDL cholesterol is less than 40 milligrams per deciliter, and he has a family history of premature coronary heart disease. True or false? According to ATP3 data, BC's 10-year CHD risk is 10 to 20%.
The best answer is one, true. BC has two or more major risk factors, specifically hypertension, a low HDL cholesterol level, and a family history of CHD. To determine the intensity of his lipid-lowering treatment, the ATP3 guidelines recommend the determination of his 10-year CHD risk, which is defined as moderate or moderately high. But BC's CHD risk can be estimated more precisely. Charts from the ATP3 guidelines, which can be found online in the third report of the National Cholesterol Education Program, can be used to calculate BC's total risk score. Risk points accumulated by BC include three for his age, five for his total cholesterol, two for his HDL cholesterol level, and three for his blood pressure. Because BC is being treated for hypertension, his point score reflects an extra point added to what is already determined for his elevated systolic blood pressure measurement. His total point score of 13 corresponds to a 10-year CHD risk of 12%. Note that the online calculator provided by the NCEP, which calculates the Framingham risk score, likely underestimates this patient's CHD risk. There are inaccuracies in this model, of course. Had BC continued to smoke, his score would have increased by five points and would have dramatically elevated his 10-year CHD risk to greater than 30%. In addition, the presence of metabolic syndrome increases his CHD risk, although it is not reflected in the 10-year calculation. Some have advocated addressing lifetime coronary risk in individuals such as this, as this may be more relevant from a patient perspective, especially in younger patients whose 10 years CHD risk may not be as indicative of their long-term hazard. Therapeutic lifestyle changes, including reinforcement of his smoking cessation, physical activity for at least 30 minutes on most, if not all, days of the week, and a TLC diet are recommended to BC. His diuretic is discontinued because of his elevated glucose level and dyslipidemia. In its place is prescribed a combination of amlodipine and benazepril once daily. Counseling is administered to reinforce the smoking cessation. Although a lipid-lowering agent is considered, BC is adamant about not taking any other medications at this time. Therefore, his initial management consists of therapeutic lifestyle changes and his new antihypertensive regimen. He is advised to return in two months. Which of the following is not a component of the TLC diet as recommended by ATP3? The best answer is two. Decrease carbohydrate intake to less than 30% of total calories. This is not a recommended component of the TLC diet. The TLC diet recommends that 50 to 60% of calories come from carbohydrate sources. However, the TLC diet has come under some criticism for this recommendation because simple carbohydrates such as sugars, refined grains, and sweets often contribute to elevated fasting glucose and triglycerides levels such as those seen in the metabolic syndrome. Other recommendations in the TLC diet include the addition of plant stanols or sterols and soluble fiber to the diet and the reduction of saturated fat and cholesterol intake. Given BC's CHD risk, what should be the goal for his LDL cholesterol level according to the ATP3 recommendations? The best answer is three, less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. The ATP3 established an LDL cholesterol goal of less than 130 milligrams per deciliter in moderate risk patients, but the updated guidelines in 2004 suggested an optional goal of less than 100 milligrams per deciliter in those patients whose risk is, quote, moderately high, unquote, meaning those with at least two CHD risk factors and a calculated 10-year risk between 10 and 20 percent. The optional goal would be even more applicable in BC's case because his risk is increased owing to the presence of metabolic syndrome. His non-HDL cholesterol level is his total cholesterol level, or 221, minus his HDL cholesterol of 36. Although the ATP3 recommended a non-HDL cholesterol goal of less than 130 milligrams per deciliter in association with an LDL cholesterol goal of less than 100 milligrams per deciliter when the triglycerides level is above 200 milligrams per deciliter. It could also be considered a secondary goal here. There is no goal for the HDL cholesterol level, but the ATP3 endorsed the tertiary goal of 